And I see the red button again. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is the first of four webinars on the Frontier Angel Accelerator uh, put on by Fledge. Um, before we get going, a couple little bits of housekeeping. Uh, so please keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking, but we do want to hear from you today. So um, do note where that mute button was. Uh, the best view is the gallery view. And when we turn off the slides, that'll let you see everyone uh, at once. Um, uh, I have the chat window up. Um, I know John has a chat window up. John and I are going to be the speakers tonight, and we're going to watch the chat window when the other person's speaking. Um, and we'll chime in if you don't want to, if for some reason you want to come off a of mute to say something, you can chat it and we'll call it out. Uh, and, uh, and this call is being recorded for all of you who are not here live. All right, so five things on the agenda tonight. Um, we're talking about angel investors. So we're talking about building angel accelerators around the world. And before we can talk about what that is, we need to define what an angel investor is. Uh, and in fact, who should be an angel investor and, and who should not. Uh, John Seacrest, I'll introduce himself, but he's gonna give a little background on uh, this thing that's been running in Seattle for seven years called the Seattle Angel Conference, which um, got started elsewhere. Uh, I will then jump in and explain the theory of how we're going to take that model and morph it to fund accelerators um, with the assumption here that we're all running accelerators. We all need funding for that. Um, doesn't mean you can't run it the way John's been running in here in Seattle. That's totally fine too. Uh, then we're going to break out into little groups to get some feedback. Actually, I think the feedback comes later. We're going to um, then going to open it up to you guys. We want to send out a survey. We want to understand uh, how investing works in all these cities that you're working in. Uh, we're trying to unpack assumptions and uncover hidden assumptions uh, and break assumptions that we have. Uh, and so before we send the survey, we want to make sure that that matches uh, what's needed. Uh, and then we're going to break out into little groups to try and um, do some of that tonight while we're live in front of each other. And we're going to try and do all of that in 90 minutes. All right, so with that, I'm going to unshare my screen and hand it over to John to explain some history of the Seattle Angel Conference. You're on mute, John. Sorry about that. Um, how are we doing the slides? Are you doing the slides and projecting, or am I doing it? You're on mute, too. Okay, so um, while he's working on that, um, we can talk a little bit. Um, my thought is to spend a little bit of time talking about the details of the Angel Conference and talk about where it came from. But before that, let me give you a little context about me. And so next slide, uh, this is us, how you reach us. So I, I facilitate the Seattle Angel Conference um, and as Looney said, we're in round 15, so that's the beginning of year eight. But I also do a bunch of other things in the startup ecosystem, run startup weekends, try to help people with uh, lean startup methodology, which is customer development first, um, create some open coffee opportunities for entrepreneurs and investors to meet each other. And I have experience on both the technical side and sort of the um, ecosystem side to try and drive this through the process. Next slide. So the current Angel Conference is in its 15th cycle. We do twice a year an event. It takes about six months to do the whole cycle. We can talk about that. But some of the outcomes of that activity are um, we've invested in 31 companies. Um, even though we're trying to do a single investment, there are always champions that fall in love with their company and make side deals. We've invested um, 2.8 million in that process. And that's moved 350 people who were not 
um, angel investors before into being angel investors. And so um, in that process, um, we were able to um, move 20 people each cycle into this uh, space of angel investing. Because we had that happen, we got enough momentum that uh, we got the Seattle Angel Fund, which is now called the Sea Change Fund to operate. And over the last four, four years for them, they've been able to generate uh, about $10 million in investment. And in addition, another group of people who are our alumni, about 60 people are in the Seattle Angel Fund and about 48 people are in the Grub Stakes Fund. And so they wanted to have their own style of investing. And so they formed another group that's actively investing and they've been around for about a year and a half. And as a result, they, um, they have gotten themselves so that they are um, writing about a million dollars in checks so far. Um, and then one of our investors went on to uh, form a, an actual Series A venture fund, which is Flying Fish Ventures, and they've raised um, 27 million. So I think there's some substantial ecosystem consequences to this process we've been doing. And it's been going on since 2002 in, in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I just brought that program up into the Seattle area. Um, it sounds like we should spend a little bit of time on what's an angel investor. So in the United States, an angel investor is uh, defined by federal law, which says uh, everybody in the United States has to invest in registered stock, except uh, people who are a millionaire not counting their house or people who make 200000 a year. And as a consequence of that, there's two groups of people who can invest or people who are angel investors who meet those qualifications and people who are not have to use another pathway, another exemption which is why you see in the United States this broader uh, crowdfunding conversation, which tends to apply to everyone instead of just this special group. So one of the things that I would like to know somewhere in our conversation is in your con context, who can write checks, who can afford to write checks and what size checks can they afford to write um, in order for the investment in your context to be the correct investment. So next slide. Yeah, actually, I want to I want to just pause and, and yeah. uh, I don't like repeating myself unless it's super important. So I just want to make sure this is really clear. In the United States, unless you have a million dollars of assets, basically, uh, you are not allowed to invest in startups. It is it is illegal for those startups to take your money unless they jump through a bunch of new hoops that are um, that were created as of five years ago. Uh, so it's actually really hard for uh, startups to find investors because of this, um, this regulatory hurdle. Uh, and on top of that, uh, most people who do clear that hurdle, which is still millions of people because we're a highly populous country, uh, most of the people who do pass that, that uh, level of wealth don't actually invest in startups. Like 99% don't invest in startups. So of the of the 10% of the population that qualifies, 99% of them do not write angel checks. And so, so the questions uh, were, um, in your context, what is uh, an appropriate level of engagement with your angel investors? What size checks can they write? How many angels are there? Um, what's an appropriate sized investment for your company? so that we know where those kinds of things align um, with this process. So part of that is, is there a magic line in your country that people above that line can invest and others can't? So most of the European countries I've been to have no magic line. Anyone can invest in startups. It's really easy. And yet they don't. And so there's a different conversation in Europe than uh, in the United States. And I I'm unaware of what the, the rules are in all of your contexts. So going to the angel conference then, um, we, we are trying to build a pattern of investing so that groups of people can trust each other and can make group investments together. And as a result, we bring together 20 to 40 investors 
we hope to have half of them have never invested before and half have invested before. And then we try to get uh, uh, slightly more companies than there are investors. So um, this, this round of the angel conference, we have 28 investors and we have 48 companies. And so that process is working for us. We run a set of workshops ahead of time to try to build vocabulary and perspective, but also as a marketing mechanism to attract in companies and attract in potential investors so that they start getting to know each other and start using the same vocabulary as, as they connect. And then after the companies apply, we then have sort of this American Idol style activity where we read the GUST profiles. GUST is a platform for angel investing that uh, keeps track of the group of investors and it keeps track of the company so we can manage that process forward. And we select 24 quarter finalists, hear three minute pitches, do some Q and A, hear, uh, select semi-final uh, people out of that, hear 10 minute pitches, do some Q and A, finally pick six finalists where we then do active due diligence. We form, take all of the investors and split them among the finalists and then do active due diligence on all those companies. And then we have another public event where we have the six finalists present and uh, the investors go in the back room and vote and we pick one and make an investment. And if due diligence has been done right and if people fell in love with their company, then side deals will happen. So for Seattle Angel Conference number 14, we're just closing this week um, on the sidecar fund where three out of the six finalists are getting a side investment. Um, and our goal is to write a check somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000 and make that go. And frequently we're writing somewhere around $400,000 total out of that group of people. And, and so, so, so just pause there for a second. The other question we're going to bring up later is, well, what size, when there are angels in your city, what size checks do they write? Um, this is really small. If you do the math here, it's basically $5,000 per investor in, in investment capital. So 20 investors is $100,000 and 40 is 200. That's a large enough amount of money to get the companies to want to participate in this because only one of them is going to get an investment plus some side deals. Only one's guaranteed to get an investment. Uh, and so that investment needs to be big enough to get decent companies to show up so that, um, so that otherwise it's moot. You know, if all you get is, is idea stage companies, uh, no one has a chance of succeeding, then the angels actually aren't learning what they need to learn. Right, in the, in the Portland context, they run a much bigger final event. And that event has two tracks. One of the tracks is the concept level, which are the idea companies. They get a chance at a investment of 25K. And then there's a launch thing that gets the bulk of the money. And so um, you can adapt to markets where you have lots of concept companies, uh, but we found that that's not meaningful in the Seattle context. Um, in this process, the people who are doing the investment are the people doing all the work. So they read all of the Gus profiles, they argue about the Gus profiles, they, they do the selection and voting. I facilitate the process of them coming to a decision as a mechanism for them to get clarity about themselves and why they're investing in this company instead of that company. The uh, engineer that's investing will sort the companies this way. The marketing person will sort the companies this way. And by the time we get done, you know, they're intermixed and we finally floated a, a set of companies up that are uh, better companies. And so, um, that act of due diligence, that act of evaluating and stack ranking the pitches forces them to communicate what's important to them. And in the process, the room that thought they knew what they were focused on for companies gets a much broader understanding of what they're trying to do. Okay. And so the foundation of this is to build active investors. And more importantly, each cycle that we do the angel conference, we form an LLC and that LLC ends up um, being managed by one of the previous investors. So we have um, three 
three different levels of investors. We have the people that are um, coming in as participants. We have an assistant LLC manager. And we have an LLC manager. An LLC manager does all of the paperwork and management of the financial entity that is the fund that invests. And, and then and the just, just pause for a second. LLC being the name of the corporate uh, style of uh, style of incorporation used to do funds in the United States. Right. And in fact, that's going to be one of our questions we need to understand in your context. If a group of 20 or 40 people wanted to write checks to an entity, which then wrote a check, a single check to a company, what would that legal structure look like in your context? And so um, that kind of conversation is going to be important in terms of setting up a mechanism for group investments where the company is, is shielded from many very small investors. Um, usually that causes um, overhead problems when you're trying to make corporate decisions. And so um, that limited liability process forces the lead LLC manager to understand how to build the recipe to do more investments. And so our goal is to create more lead investors in the ecosystem with a bunch of relationships with other people that want to invest with them. And as a result of doing this, um, the investors get perspective on the market. Um, they uh, are risking a relatively small amount. It's $5,000 for the fund and then another $500 for the overhead of setting up everything and talking to the lawyers and so forth. In, when we ran this in California, they have extra fees associated with being a company. And so they actually took $6,000 instead of $5,500. Um, but uh, you could understand what the total overhead cost of managing a fund would be. And that's where you would get the number. Um, we, we take a bunch of very, very early startups and we connect them with very, very early angels and they tend to grow a little bit. Because we do due diligence on the finalists, they're getting better regardless of whether they win. But more importantly, we ask the investors to write comments about every company. And then at each stage, when people do not pass on to the next level, we do a, a one hour sit down with that company and walk through why they didn't get further in their process and what the issues were that the uh, investors wrote into the process. And so every company that applies gets stronger as a result of this. Um, and because they're coming to us and we're relatively forgiving in our process, um, the other angel groups that are upstream from us get better deal flow. And so there's several of our alumni that don't make it to the finals that um, within six to nine months are getting funded by other groups. And um, we now have uh, nine angel groups in Seattle and all of those angel groups have alumni from our program in it. So more and more of the angel groups are forming, uh, many from our alumni, but um, many of the other ones are now uh, catching us. And, and, no, and no, nine is a lot. Most cities, most cities in the US do not have nine angel groups. We're, we're a little busy that way. Yeah, usually, usually you end up with three, um, but I would argue that uh, most cities could afford to have nine. They just haven't got the process in place to make it go. Yeah, well, if we had enough angels investing, and we had enough rich people investing, we could have we could have a hundred in each city. But, um. Sure, and they na they tend to naturally sort of top out at somewhere between 150 and 200 participants in each one. Um, it's very rare to have you know a thousand people in an angel group, and it's certainly very rare to have any active angels in a thousand person angel group. How big is uh, Full Circle or Tonic? Onik was, uh, they called it 180, but it was two, per, two people per, per paying customer. Last, last I saw the number. Uh, okay. And Investor Circle, before they merged in with, with an org that isn't an angel group, uh, had about 180. It's 25 years old. It never had more than 200. Right. So that, that's the normal place where we have um, the, some kind of sociological process where it stops working. Yeah, um, and we can talk about angel groups in the Q&A or, or in a future webinar if, if that's a good Right, thing. right. Well, so part of our goal out of the process is to um, grow enough angel investors that they go on to produce other angel groups. 
So or, other, or other investments of any kind. Or other investments as well, yes. Um, and then, um, you know, fundamentally, people do angel investments and don't know what they're doing. And the side effect of that is that they end up, uh, hold on a sec, I have to remove a cat from the room. So while he's doing that, I'll just say, right, uh, despite the wealth in Seattle and the number of successful startups and public companies we have here, uh, we still don't have enough angel investors. Even with John's efforts for seven years, uh, we still have way more companies that want money than, than uh, people writing checks, both angels and funds. Yeah, absolutely. And there's several critical areas of uh, startup or software development that are not getting funded because there's not an angel group that um, pays attention to them. And so, for example, the Sea Change Fund has no sector bias but they're seeing a significant number of biotech companies because there's no effective biotech investment group in town. Um, if we're going to do well at this, we would like people to not write a few checks and then decide it's a terrible activity and quit. We'd like them to actually um, invest regularly, which means that if we increase the number of investors, we get more money in the ecosystem, if we increase the number of deals, we get more opportunities for investors to make investments. But more deals without quality don't help. And so there's activities you can do to improve the quality of the deals. And we want to um, try to figure out how the investors can build a reasonable portfolio. And my belief is that a reasonable portfolio is at least 20 deals. So an angel investor should figure out how they expect to get to 20 deals. And if they haven't figured that out before they get in too far, they probably shouldn't be doing angel investing until they figure that pathway out for themselves, which is part of what we do at the angel conference. Next. So um, part of this is that angel investing is a, is a process that may or may not work. And so, People have to understand that there's lots of uncertainty in the process. When we get people who have financial or banking industry experience, they uh, frequently apply levels of certainty expectations to the process that just aren't there. You know, we have two guys, an idea, a couple of customers and not much else. And you can't go looking through everything expecting a full size company there. Um, we know that if people invest in things they know, they do better. We know that if they diversify their portfolio, they do better. Um, the, the act of doing due diligence, uh, Rob Wiltbank has some uh, research around uh, at least 20 hours of due diligence tends to improve your outcomes. Um, we know that if you engage in the startups afterwards, that that improves your outcomes. Um, and if you're as a part of the angel process, making introductions into your industry and that you're helping the startups manage what to expect as they head down this rocky road, that you actually improve the outcomes of the whole process. And interestingly enough, a lot of this looks like the kind of mentoring we would expect at an accelerator. And so there's some notion that there's an overlap between people who want to invest in companies and people who want to mentor companies. And so that, that aligns pretty nicely. There, there is definitely some overlap and I'll cover that in a minute. Yep. And so we, we started this in Oregon, 2002. I, I ended up forming the Willamette Angel Conference in 2007. Um, when I moved to Seattle, I saw that as an opportunity, but we've moved this into other places as well. So it's starting to spread as a recipe. Um, different organizations have played the hosting role, but we essentially run this, this kind of recipe. The angel challenge in Norway is probably the one that's furthest off from our recipe. Um, they, they are uh, a little bit faster in terms of their cycle time and definitely are spending more time focused on uh, making the story happen than the due diligence part of it. But next. So if, if um, we can increase the success rate of our growth companies, we totally change the ecosystem that we're working in. And so part of that is giving them the resources they need. And part of that is 
supporting them through that process. And as we um, increase the quality of the startup founders, um, we end up decreasing the risk from the startups and everything starts moving forward, right? And as angel investors, we can connect those startups to resources. We can help uh, create the social validation where a lot of other things happen because somebody believes in the startup and because of that belief, they make some progress. Next. So my, my basic thought is everybody thinks that there's entrepreneurs everywhere. And if that's true, then we would expect that there are investors everywhere. And so how do we make that happen so that local communities can invest in themselves and the angel conference process is starting to do that across several cities. Okay. We're going to stop. Yeah. yeah. Next, next one. So part of that question then gets back to this notion of accredited investor. And so there's about 10% uh, in the United States that are angel investors. And if you figure out what the percentage of people in your area that can do that kind of check. Um, and in this case, this is a calculation for um, Anchorage, Alaska. And so we would expect 300 people in Anchorage, Alaska to be writing checks. And um, there are 25 in the Alaska Angel Network, something like that. And, and I'm and I'm one of them and I don't live in Alaska. Well, and, and there's another couple of places where there's some checks being written. So I would say it's closer to 50, but it's significantly off of this expectation of 300. Next. And so if you were to do an angel conference, I have some thoughts about how to do that. Um, we can discuss this in some detail, um, but we have to adjust it for your context to try to make sure that it makes appropriate sense. When I visited Vietnam in August, it became pretty clear that the size of a check that I was thinking of was not the size of a check that would be the right size check in Vietnam. It, their economy is significantly smaller and the amount of money that they need to get to the next milestone is substantially less than what I'm working with in Seattle. So next is questions. Yeah. Does anybody have questions? You guys still awake? It was just the one question that came through from Erica earlier on who takes care of due diligence, but I was guessing you were addressing that, John, when you were talking about the actual investors themselves who form the LLC. They are the ones that are responsible for the DD, right? Right, exactly. So we're not, so there are five different models for how groups behave, uh, networks, managed funds, passive funds, active funds, and event funds. We're running an event fund where the active work is done by the investors, including all the due diligence, that's part of the goal. You know, if I'm writing a check, I should understand the finances of the company. I should understand the marketing of the company. Yeah. Okay, if there's no questions, we'll continue on and we'll press you for questions later. Back to sharing. All right, so that was the starting point. Uh, we've seen that work. We've seen that work in multiple cities, at least in North America uh, and in Norway. Uh, we've seen it work uh, dozens and dozens of times. Um, and it does, in fact, create, uh, you know, it spits out the other end people who feel like they know way more about angel investing than they did before. Um, and about, about half of them continued to write checks in Seattle. So of the 350, we have slightly over 150 that are writing checks. So um, that's a key piece. Uh, it's a super important, uh, as I said before, uh, we don't have enough check writers even in the city of Seattle. Um, despite 10,000 Microsoft millionaires and some number of thousands of Amazon millionaires, they're just not active in this area. Um, so the question is, how do we reuse this idea? Um, oh, there's another question. So Min is asking if, uh, how do we train these investors? And okay. the answer that I would say is the angel conference is a Socratic training mechanism to teach them how to invest by doing an investment. Um, at the beginning, there's a bunch of curriculum that we put into the workshops, but the overlap between who attends the workshops and who does the investing tends to be different. And part of that is because the investors in the United States 
tend to be relatively successful and relatively opinionated and relatively busy. And so talking at them in a curriculum doesn't usually turn into them activating. But when you have them do an angel investment, they ask all sorts of questions and then we can teach them through those questions. So when the investors, so in the United States, we, we use an exemption called Reg D 506B, which is private solicitation. And private solicitation um, requires us not to generally advertise the offer. And because we're making an investment in the angel conference, that's uh, an SEC regulated activity. So we find the investors by working through the network of people that we know, right? So we go and talk to people who are investors. They have friends who could be investors and we just keep working that. So that's one of the hard parts of the work that has to be done. Um, and we try to train the LLC manager how to do that work because that's how they will be doing the create a, a group of people to invest in their LLC uh, if they're running it on their own. Um, but in the end, um, we're, we're working through the social network. The other side of that, you use the word curate, which is to suggest that some people get to invest and some people don't get to invest. And we provide the LSE manager with a significant amount of um, power in the ability to accept or not accept specific people into the program. So just because they want in doesn't mean they get in. Um, and we know that there are certain people that don't play nice. And so, um, and how, often, all, how often does that happen, John? Probably every third one, we have somebody who doesn't play nice. And um, the, the first time it happened, I was very surprised. And the second time I tried to take care of it early um, and then it blew up anyway. And so now I've become much more aggressive about filtering people with bad behavior. What does it mean not to play nice in this context? Well, um, you can't be the, the kind of people that have to win. You know, if your opinion has to be the one that's correct all the time, or if you have to dominate the conversation, that really doesn't make for a good group decision. And so um, the Canadians do very well at this. They all let everybody at the table speak and everything moves forward in a nice gentle way. That doesn't happen always in the United States. And so um, we've had people that had to, had to be right more than follow the process. And as a result, um, uh, we don't invite some of them back. And some of them, we have a conversation that if you do that again, we'll give you your money back and you're not gonna participate anymore. Yeah, and I'd say we, I run, I run a bunch of prize funds for business plan competitions um, from years ago. Uh, we had a year where one of the investors basically threw up his hands at the finals and said, there aren't any investable companies here. Uh, and he had signed the documents to invest, but he never, he had yet to send his check in, which is one more issue that comes along. Like, do you let them play before the check shows up? Uh, and in this case, it was a prize fund. So we did, uh, but he never wrote that check. So uh, we had made promises. Other people had to cover for him. Um, so, uh, what happens in the world of investing, because it's, um, it's a very networky interpersonal, uh, activity. No one ever invested it with him again. No one in that group ever wanted to, to let him into another deal. And right. And so know, that's, and, th and that's one of the things that we get out of the angel conference is that you've got this group of people who are working together for 12 weeks. And at the end, you can pretty much tell who in the room you'd like to invest with and who you don't. And so that's one of the lessons, right? Not everybody invests the same way. And if you have two people with very different views about what makes a good investment, you can actually make a mess of a startup by having the wrong advice from the wrong place. So. Yeah, before you answer the, Eric, the Erica's latest question, uh, there, there's also the piece where um, what you'll learn when you, in, when you, I'm an investor as well as an entrepreneur, um, what you learn when, when investing with fellow investors is sometimes you find people with uh, skills you lack. And so I'm known in the room as the finance guy. I can read a, a pro forma. I can find the flaw. 
Uh, so um, people like to jump in with me if they're weak on finances uh, and other people I like to invest in because they always ask like the first question out of their mouth is just incredibly insightful and something I didn't think of. Um, and I want them to be co-investors because I want them to pop up uh, potential issues that, that I'm not thinking of because I'm too busy thinking about business model. Right. Act, actually, it makes perfect sense. And uh, Erica, yes, we do uh, send out a PPM, which is the agreement around um, how, how the, fit, the operation of the LLC works and who gets what power and how decisions are made and so forth. And we've recently, because of some of these social frictions, added in uh, code of conduct, um, which gets kind of explicit about um, how we want people to behave. And then in the first meeting, we talk about that and hand it out. And just the same way, we also talk about um, a confidentiality clause that we put in there. So we want the companies to feel like they can trust us and work with us. And so we want everything that's said by the companies in the room to stay in the room and not be shared with other people. And so um, we work both of those things uh, through the, for many of the first sessions. Okay. Oh, no, another question came in. Uh, oh no, that's a thank you. All right. So, um, uh, you know, John went through a whole bunch of material there. One piece he did really quickly was just this fact that there are a, there are a bunch of weeks before the formal part of this program begins where there are workshops, and so the workshops exist for two reasons. One, they're the time when you can recruit both the investors and the entrepreneurs, because in this model, you need both. Um, uh, in both models, you need both. I'll, show, I'll tell you the second model in a second. Um, and that's the moment in time where there is some uh, curriculum where people are, are people, experts are speaking. Uh, and so those include Angel 101, uh, financial modeling, pitching, um, you know, a, a mix of topics that are useful for both entrepreneurs and investors. And depending on the week, you'll get a, a different mix of, of 60, 40, 70, 30, one or the other. But every time I went, there were, there were both sides there. Um, uh, that's a really important part. And, and what we expect um, is that those experts don't exist or are hard to find in your region. And so in the Frontier Angel Accelerator, we will be providing that information uh, in the form of recorded uh, uh, talks um, by John and I and other experts. Uh, and so you will have access to that content that you can either bring people in a room and, and show it to them and have a discussion or share with them and then bring them in a room and do something else with them. Uh, but we wanna make sure you have uh, the same tools we have here and the same expertise we have here, no matter where you are, uh, at least in English, right? And we do know language is a problem. All right, um, and so the variant of this that I heard, um, need, you know, back in Singapore, what I kept hearing was, uh, we don't have enough angels, we don't have enough investors in our city. Um, and the second issue that I heard was, uh, how do we raise enough money to do the investing style of an, of an accelerator? And so I think the answer, and we have not done this yet. So I think the answer is to take 80% um, of the Seattle Angel Conference and 100% of a, of a business accelerator and mash them together and get 180% solution because it really is a startup accelerator and an angel accelerator running at the same time. So uh, the proposal I have for Seattle is $11,000 for each investor. And again, uh, the typical check in Seattle for a full scale angel investor, I'll call it, is $25,000. Uh, the Seattle Angel Conference is five. My thinking here was there's 350 angels who have already done uh, at least one $5,000 check. I want to give them some place to do twice that. Um, and, uh, and we'll see in the next year. Uh, we'll, I'll run mine the same time you run yours. Uh, and we'll see if that works. So $10,000 in capital that goes into the programming and a $1,000 fee, which I may drop down if, if we get too much pushback on that. Uh, the goal in Seattle, the budget for me to run one session of Fledge in Seattle is $250,000. So I'm looking for 25 angels at $10,000 a piece. 
That then gets me the budget needed to run the startup accelerator and it gets me enough money and then some, uh, 25 is, is more than I would need to run the angel accelerator. Um, but if you're going to run this in, and it's worth that to the angels, don't, don't charge costs. You should be teaching that, right? Don't, don't charge what it costs you, charge what it's worth to them. Um, and then we suddenly break off from the last pattern that you just saw on a half hour ago. Um, so it starts with the same workshops, um, teach them how to be investors. Uh, in this case, some of the topics may be a little different because, um, uh, uh, I want I want the angels that pop out of this angel accelerator to not only know how to make one investment, but how to make a portfolio of investments. So that's Angel Investing 201. Uh, so do some recruiting at the same time you're doing the recruiting for the startup accelerator. And then get those angels in a room for, and John and I have been arguing how long that needs to be, um, two or three weeks at least. Um, to get them to five, six, yeah. four, five, six, and 10. Yeah. Um, as, as little as, as feasible, um, uh, to get them in a room to pick the startups that you're inviting into the startup accelerator. And so we both agree that the important part is they're picking the startups that, that it's their taste and their, um, in this case, overly quick learning on what makes a good selection to pick it, but ultimately it's their money. It's not your money. You shouldn't be picking. It's their money. They should be picking. If they make mistakes for, for a few, that's a learning experience. Everyone makes mistakes when they're new to angel investing. Um, so they pick the startups. And now, uh, and in, in Seattle, we do seven at a time. I know other accelerators do uh, uh, eight, nine, 10, even 12 and 15. Um, I always advocate for seven. It's, it's, it's enough startups to then um, it's plenty of startups to then worry about follow on funding. Uh, and it's plenty of startups for one manager to, to deal with every week. Um, so I just like the number seven, uh, and it's a magic number in, in Western uh, mythology. Anyway, so the angels pick the startups, uh, and then depending on how long you have to wait for the startups to show up, um, there may be a break in there. And so there may be time to teach them more. Um, uh, and then the startup accelerator runs. And while the startup accelerator is running, it's running and you're inviting these investors to come in and mentor their teams, right? Their companies, their investors, they own these companies. So they should have a pretty good incentive to come in and do that um, and do it from you know, their expertise as well as their investor hat. Um, the goal is not only to have them come in and do some mentorship like any other mentor, but come in and you're teaching them on a weekly basis, like an, uh, an after work once a week. Um, uh, uh, session, you're teaching them how to be a lead investor, which is something different altogether. If you've not dealt with a lot of investors, there are lead investors and there are follower investors and they're very different, um, very different beasts. Um, we don't have enough lead investors around either. Uh, a lead investor is someone who knows how to set terms and is willing to use some social capital to go out to their friends uh, go out to their network and try and find more investors. Someone who can lead a deal and put together all the money that's needed or a significant amount of the money that's needed to do the next round of investing. All right, so in the startup accelerator I run, we do $20,000 checks to each of the companies that show up. It costs them $10,000 just to be in Seattle. It's an expensive city. So we're really giving them $10,000 of startup capital, which is not enough. No matter where in the world they're running, that's not enough, they need more. So the goal of this uh, uh, angel accelerator is twofold. One, teach people to be angels, just like the angel conference, but do it so that it's funding an accelerator and teaching people how then to do the, the to lead the follow-ons so that it doesn't all fall on your shoulders. Right? And that's a key piece here. And assume that you'll get uh, uh, repeats just like the Seattle angel conference gets. So the first time through it might work okay, but the second time through, hopefully 12, 13, 14, or 15 of those angels were in the last round. And so they're not there to learn as much as they're there to practice their leadership, um, to be the ones to help pick the startups and lead that effort because they've done it before. And now they've seen you know, two months or three months of, uh, of due diligence of these companies. Uh, and again, we haven't done this before. We haven't proven that it works, but you know, numerically on paper, it should work. 
the only hang up and the only argument John and I are having over this structure is how long do you need to work with the angels to pick the startups? Um, because he's concerned that they're just going to pick bad startups because they've never done it before. And so first time through, you may have to curate and, um, and uh, work on the group think, or you may actually have to uh, push the conversations a lot harder than you would the second time through when there's some experience in the room. Or we may hear from you that there are some angels already in your city. And if you can get some experienced angels to come in and act like the loud uh, leaders, uh, we may not have that problem on the first run through. On the other hand, uh, sometimes angels already have opinions about how the world works and it doesn't involve group investing. And so yeah. San Diego was extra complex because we had uh, existing angels coming in and being uh, antisocial. Okay. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they got rich some way um, and uh, they're not going to admit that it was mostly luck. Um, yep. Nobody, you know, almost no one ever admits that. Uh, and so they tend to have some strong opinions or they have some money either inherited or they earned it um, and they have no confidence that they know how uh, startups work and they just get stuck. I, 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 uh, I've met plenty of people in Seattle who could invest and don't because they, they just don't feel comfortable doing it and, uh, and wouldn't feel comfortable speaking up in a room of other angels admitting that they don't know how this works. There's lots of hangups that stop people from doing this. So I yeah. see a question about how long each round would take from start to graduation. Okay, so it depends on a few things. It depends on uh, how many weeks of recruiting you think it's going to take in your city. So John, you're doing eight weeks? Something yeah, like I do uh, actually 10 weeks of recruiting. Okay, so assume it's 10 weeks of recruiting. Uh, there could be in the, in the angel accelerator version I'm showing here, maybe, maybe you start screening before everybody is, is signed up, right. To try and get more weeks of, um, of screening in there. Uh, you know, I, I send out my screening stuff right now to every one of my current investors, uh, to get their feedback. I also send it to, to lots of other people as well to get their feedback, right? Just cause you get feedback doesn't mean that's the final decision. Um, so you have a certain number of weeks of recruiting. You then have a certain number of weeks of selection where, where you really got to be heads down um, selecting. Um, uh, and, I, you know, every program is a little different. I can do that uh, in the current system without 25 people behind me uh, in two weeks. Uh, then there's a period of time where uh, to run my program, I have to wait for them to get visas. So that's a seven week waiting period where we don't do anything. And then the program itself, I just shortened it from, from nine weeks to seven weeks. So then there's seven weeks of actual startup accelerator where the angels are expected to be. So if you add that all up and, and calendar that out for the angel investors, it's a long run. You're asking them to commit for, uh, for many, many weeks of effort. Uh, and, um, and that may be too much of them, and that may be just fine. Um, in the Seattle Angel Conference version, they don't go to all 10 uh, pre-weeks, they go to some of them. And then the, the actual uh, selection process is 12 weeks long. So they're committed for like four months, right? Uh, at least most of the time. And they're only meeting right. um, once a week over those 12 weeks to do the selection. The same thing in, in the proposed program would be once a week after work, they're coming in a room together to maybe learn a little bit and again, we'll provide plenty of content that you can bring into those rooms. And especially to be in a room to discuss what they learned in the last week in talking to the startups. Um, so remember, I said 25 investors and I only do seven startups. So that's almost four investors per startup. Uh, so if they only like one, which is rare, they usually like two or three, but if they only pick one to go after, there's potentially four lead investors per startup. Um, so this could, if all goes well, lead to really quick follow on rounds because you got four people who can use social capital to go and help uh, pull together the, the follow on money. All right. Now the benefits of doing this uh, is threefold. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to discount the first one. You create an angel community that's attached to your organization. So you're creating a community 
who learned how to do deal flow from your accelerator deal flow or your incubator deal flow if you want to fund your incubator this way. Um, which means when they want to do the next deal, they're going to look to you and, um, and that's a good thing, right? Uh, because finding investors in your deals is hard. Uh, and finding, I gotta say, the reason I send my uh, shortlist to so many people is that I'm trying to make sure I'm picking companies that investors like, right? I want feedback from investors on my shortlist because I know what I like, but what I like doesn't always match what the investors like and I need them to invest, right? It doesn't work if I bring in a company and give them $20,000 and that's the last money uh, they ever see. That, that's not helpful for them or me. Um, or my investors, uh, my, my traditional investors. Uh, twofold, it, this goes one step beyond they've written a check and they know how to do some due diligence. This goes to the stage of they can take the work off your hands of leading the follow-ons. And that might take two or three uh, rounds through the system before that works. Um, uh, getting people to the comfort zone where they understand terms and understand uh, how to pull in other investors it's unlikely you'll get you'll get many people out of the, the this is called 25 that come out feeling comfortable doing that um, but at least they'll know some of it which in which case if you fill in the gaps which I've done for many of my traditional investors it's still uh, a whole lot of burden off your shoulders uh, and the third one is not unimportant John said um, it's like an hour ago now that you got to make 20 investments so if you want to make money as an angel investor, you have to expect to make 20 investments. And so if you're doing it by starting with a few rounds of the angel conference, and maybe you do that three times, now you're up to three, but you still got 17 to go, which is a lot. Um, and if you go off to an angel group, you're probably doing one or two per year there as well. Whereas if you're doing this through, through an accelerator and the terms are, you are helping select the companies, but your money is going into all of them. And so in my case, if it's seven companies at a time, if you do it three times, you now have 21 companies. You now have a diversified portfolio. It's really small amounts in each one. It's not, uh, it's not a huge check in each one, but at least you now have diversified your, your potential losses across 21 um, or 30 if you're doing 10 per session. And the odds of 20 or 30 going bust, all, of, all 20 or 30 going bust in a year or two is pretty small. Right, way smaller than if you're investing in three. Odds are, even in Seattle, if you invest in three, odds are three years from now you have three losers. All right, so uh, on to the next piece, which is, where is the survey, John? It's in the folder. Okay. Um, do you need it turned into a survey? Because it's only a piece of text right now. Um, why don't we just walk through it? You pull it up and, and you walk through in, in verbal form. And so uh, while you're doing that, I'll take any questions on um, on the Angel Conference or the Angel Accelerator version. One of the things that would be helpful is to know um, how many companies you get applying versus how many you end up selecting. Yeah. Actually, let me ask that of the crowd. In, in your current system, if you can just, you can throw that in the chat window if you want. Um, what is your ratio of applicants versus invitees? So uh, mine was current, current session, uh, crazy numbers, um, 454 applications and seven got invited. 450, ouch. Yeah. Ouch, ouch more for the entrepreneurs. Right. Reading 450, that was okay, but um, picking only seven of them was incredibly painful. I'll bet. Do you, um, do you cross-refer your second bests to anywhere else or? Well, we started replicating Fledge in other cities. So um, yeah. they're all in the pool that other cities can pick from. Cool. Uh, and we have not pushed them anywhere else at the moment because we are in the seven week period waiting for visas and historically we don't get them all. And so then we have to go further down the list and bring someone in who was number eight or nine or 10. Okay, so we, we and so, uh, 
not where I expected it. So I'm going to have to do some yeah. hunting. Okay. Well I, well, I know some of the questions. So um, we were going to do breakout rooms, but there's only five, you know, we're not counting Ian here. There's only five <laughs> on, the, on the call. So if we can get you to um, flip on your video and unmute yourself um, so we can see you and talk to you. Easier said than done. Hi. Hi, class. Hello. There we go. Hello. Hi. I remember you. Mid. All right. Well, at least we get, we got some. We got two. Come on. It's not that scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll we'll start with uh, Erica because you've been you've been asking. Oh, no. them. Uh, what are what are um what are angels what's the typical angel look like where you're from and remind us where you're from hi uh, i'm from manila in the philippines um there aren't a lot of angels so that's the ones that we've worked with um typically are very so sorry we work with early stage enterprises mm -hmm. so they're very risk averse and usually they're more interested in follow-on funding more than the initial round. So we're looking, exploring ways to involve them earlier on and trying to, re, trying to figure out some strategy where it includes both the experience and the education part, So this, which is why this is super interesting to me, to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have, the tip, you have a typical problem, which is they don't want to invest in startups. They want to invest mm -hmm. in growth companies. Exactly. Um, and do or, you they, have, or they want to invest in real estate because real estate uh, is predictable. Well, in a sense, um, especially, well, also there is a, a lot of familiarity with impact enterprises. So that's also part of the problem. Um, they're really looking for more commercial investments. And we're trying to educate the market because typically the ones who are investing commercially are also the ones more interested or can write the checks for impact enterprise investments. Okay, do you have any idea what size checks are normal for early growth companies that pass their bar of, of risk? Well, for us, um, it's typically, it starts at $50,000. So we're looking at, at that as the maximum and exploring ranges between 10 to 20. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, how about you, Klaus? Where are you, where are you from, and what does an angel look like there? Yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, I work in Yangon mostly, in Myanmar, and um, yeah, I don't think there's this thing like a typical angel in Myanmar. It's a fairly uh, new and informal uh, setting. So um, I would say it's it, from what I know, uh, it's pretty much all over the place. So some people invest in in early stage. Um, companies some invest in more yeah developed advanced enterprises um it has also happened to i think one or two in the impact uh, space so social enterprises um generally it's very much based on personal connections and if someone knows someone and they con can convince them of the idea so this is usually how it works it's a very informal setting as i said there were some <coughs> initiatives and some attempts to set up a, an angel network um, but that didn't really lead anywhere so um, a couple of people have tried that but I think it's it's really like the culture in the business culture is very much kind of not telling other people you know about you and what you have so even angels telling other angels that they exist and that they want to invest and where they want to invest is something that is already problematic I would say so um, that that is the barrier there. So it's as I said, it's a very much like one to one kind of thing where the entrepreneurs sometimes get lucky and through the personal connections they get to know angels and then yeah they get investment. So that's it's really like that. So I, mm -hmm. I can't see say that I can't recognize any patterns or anything. And, and what percentage of the population of Myanmar is middle class? That's a, a good question. I actually don't know but it's a very low percentage i mean i, I would estimate somewhere around five percent maybe probably what you would say like that can actually participate in the economy as you know you buy services and, and products uh, above what you what you need for you know eating and surviving from yeah 
above the basic yeah. level of existence. What's the what's the percentage of Myanmar that's agricultural? Uh, you know, still on the the fields. I think it's like seventy percent, something like that. Yeah. The population. Yeah. So that's about about where Vietnam was about fifteen years ago. Yeah. And, and I, I'm used to dealing in Africa, and um, you know that sounds way advanced. It's it's still eighty five to ninety percent farmers in in the yeah. country I'm dealing with. Yeah, it's also like I mean in any numbers that you get from Myanmar are highly unreliable. So um, it's everything is just an, an estimate, really. Like, you know, because how these things are done is, yeah, fairly questionable. <laughs> so if you look in your community and you start counting these, you know, 2% here and 3% there, um, it feels like it's a small number. But if you count the total number of bodies, the possibility of drawing in 10 to 20 people to do this is still available. It's within your social network that there are people that can write these checks if they mm -hmm. choose to. Um, and so um, the experience that you're describing is very similar to several of the communities I've been in. Um, Corvallis started out, you know, it's only 50,000 people total. And so everybody said you can't run an angel conference there. There's not enough people. And yet, um, through personal connections, it's totally possible to make that happen. And, and still running, you said. That one's uh, still well, it, they just They just stopped it. So it ran for 10 years and they deployed $4 million in the process. So. Okay. How about you, Min? Hi, I'm Min from Vietnam. Uh, in fact, John, you have been here in, in Vietnam uh, last year, so you may recognize that uh, the community of angels really early in, in the country and the concept of investing in startup is just very new. So yeah. uh, the question of educating the angel investors and forming the uh, angel community is quite important here for the startups to grow. I've been working with hundreds of startups here and some of them got angel investment is around 10 to 20K. But the problem is uh, when they get investment, they always um, kind of uh, in the lower position where they have to kind of ask for investment more than negotiating for, for kind of more mutual benefits. So the problem arising is that after getting the investment, the company co collapsed uh, it, in many cases. And that's the question to me that how to build a true good investment uh, angel investors community where they support the growth of the startups more than, I mean, uh, come to kind of zero sum game or something like that. So, so I, I was in Hanoi and Da Nang and I didn't make it to Ho Chi Minh City. Mm -hmm. um, are you in Ho Chi Minh City? It's much better. Uh, the yeah. mindset is much better, yes. Uh, still, they, uh, I, I, we also have a group of uh, 24, uh, Kind of successful entrepreneurs in uh, tourism and hospitality, where we, where we we think that uh, begin with an, an a specific industry is um, is much better. Uh, but the question is how to educate the investors and and really because they need training. I, I truly believe that they they have the money, but they don't know how to spend it effectively in investing in startups. So. The big question to me right now is to really train the investors and in how to create something like a conference like that is, is really interesting to me. So, so when I was in Vietnam, one of the things that I know, you know, I visited the I Angel group and I visited a couple other angel groups. And the things that I noticed was that the, the angels that they were picking were not angels. Exactly. Um, they did not they their goal was not to invest their goal was to own the company so what they right. were trying to do was to reach into the startup get enough of a hold on it and then suck it into their personal empire that they were building exactly. and so um, they had never thought about the notion that angels come at different levels and i'm this training works for angels at the bottom level of angel investors, you know, a million to 5 million in net worth in the United States context is the group oriented investment thing that needs to happen. If I'm, you know, up in the hundred million dollar range, I can do pretty much what I want. So I do. 
and then I don't play nice with other people, right? And mm-hmm. that was the kind of person that I was meeting that were playing the angel role and being the mentors. But mm-hmm. when you look underneath their behavior, they were collecting uh, people into their pile, right? right. And they, they wrote, it, wrote checks for themselves to own pieces of the company. So mm-hmm. the notion of curating your investors so that you have investors that are at a level where group investing makes sense for them to do, that they have a need to, to group invest will make mm-hmm. it easier for you to create a group of investors that work together to make something happen. If somebody's okay. very, very successful, uh, mm-hmm. multi-hundred millionaire kind of person, the person that built Time City kind of person, they just do what they want. As right. the feeling I got, and I was only there three weeks, so I, this is an impression, not a fact. Yeah, and it's always hard for us to understand a culture in a, in a two-week, three-week, four-week trip. Um, right? We just get a glimpse. But I do want to, I said, I hate to repeat myself, but I am going to repeat this one again. Uh, the customer segment that has succeeded in the, in the angel conference model are just rich enough to write $5,000 checks right, in our context, but not rich enough to write the normal $25,000 check of a, a, we'll call it a full scale angel. So um, just quick math, if I can get this right in my head, right? Uh, if you're gonna do, actually I'm gonna pull up the calculator, get it right. Um, if you're gonna do $25,000 investments, uh, which is the norm, um, you know, norm in the angel groups in Seattle, and you're gonna do 20 of them, that's deploying uh, $5 million, $500,000? I don't know. No. No, so if I'm a five millionaire person, I have five million, and I take ten percent. Five hundred thousand. Sorry, yeah, five hundred thousand dollars in total to do twenty investments at at twenty five thousand dollars a piece. Um, Which means if you have a million dollars of assets, you're not going to spend half of it on startups. That is, that is, um, that's a bad choice. That's, that's, I know I know somebody who did, and they're not happy. Yeah, they're, they're, no, they're, they're, they're people who overdo everything, right? You can yeah. you can overdo um, you can overdo drinking water, um, yes. but um, uh, just so this is the numbers that we're trying to figure out here is uh, in your community. If assuming there's no rules, um, what constitutes someone who is feeling comfortably rich, but not excessively rich? Not the people that you were seeing in Vietnam who said, I just want the whole company because the people that, that we're targeting here can't just buy the whole company. They don't have the money to do it. And so you get rid of that problem by, by targeting the right customer segment of people who can write a check for X where X can't buy the whole company, right? And 20 X can't buy the whole company. Right. And 20 X would be, would be affordable to them uh, but you know, it would be five or ten percent of their entire net worth. That's that's the calculation. We'll go through that in way more details next week or uh, next time. Um, uh, I do want to get through the rest of the people real quick here. We got twelve minutes, so uh, kiss startup. My team. Um, oh, my my team team. has three. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's my team already. Yeah. All right. How about uh, Hien Hien at Wise? You're on mute. Hello, Wise. Or oh, she left the room. All right. If not, um, from some of the comments I heard, I uh, uh, someone said um, you're not seeing angels for impact startups in your community. Uh, one bit of feedback I can pull back from uh, from Africa. Uh, I was at the Sankalp Africa conference um, a few weeks ago, last month, uh, just a month ago. Uh, 1,200 people, they are all impact investors. Um, uh, But the word impact rarely ever shows up at that conference. It's just investing. So in the context of Africa, when we're talking about investing in startups, there is no distinction by the investors. There's no verbal distinction by the investors of what's impact and what's not. Um, Inside their organizations, they may use those terms. They may do impact measurement. Um, But 
in the con in the in the ecosystem context, everybody's mixed together, and some of them are looking for California style tech companies. Um, some of them are looking for growth scale companies that are that are um, building apps for the middle class. Uh, but most of the investors that are uh, pulling money into that continent are just looking for investments that do good in the world. And anything you do is almost anything you do is, is good in the world um, just because there's so much poverty. Uh, and so you, one thing you got to watch out for is the messaging you're using for what kind of companies you're dealing with and what you may not even want to call them impact companies. Um, the word SME shows up a whole lot in the African context of these are not startups, these are SMEs. And then we wind up having uh, overly long discussions on, well, what's an SME? Is that, is that a $300 micro loan to someone who's living in a rural village or a slum? Or is that a company that's earning a million dollars in revenue but isn't gonna go IPO? Uh, and that's all called SMEs in, in the African context. Um, so I'm used to just dealing with, with investors when I'm dealing with African uh, startups. All right, well, well um, in the agenda, the last thing we wanted to do was this part where we're, well, we're mixing together the, the uh, give us more feedback on the survey and give us. Um, you want me to share the questions that I have? Yes, please. So we want feedback on these questions, not answers to the questions. So we were going to ask, you know, uh, the basic stuff, who are you? What size of the region are you considering? You know, the thing you pay attention to. How many people are in that area? What's the average wage in that area so that we can sort of calibrate what a normal investment might look like? Um, how many wealthy people capable of investing are there in the region? That's not people who are investing, but people who have enough wealth to invest. Um, what's the right amount of funding for a startup? Uh, getting the first round of outside money. What's the average round side for, and I don't know in your context, what's the different stages, but our first three stages are pre-seed, seed, and, and series A. So for example, it's not unreasonable to get a, a $100,000 pre-seed and then a two hundred and fifty to 500,000 seed and then a million uh, series A. And then- in, in Seattle for an American company, just, just to be clear. Right. So, uh, actually, these are probably old numbers, the more like Boise instead of Seattle. Um, things are sort of uh, going upstream for us. This is, this is significantly different. The numbers I used are different in the Bay Area by uh, at least a factor of two, maybe three. Um, we typically see valuations for a company in Boise at 1.8 million where the company, same company in Seattle would be 3.4 million and that same company would be 9 million in the Bay Area. So the prices shift around a bit. How far are mentors willing to travel to participate? So our expectation is that the angels that are investing are also visiting with your companies in person. And so maybe travel limits their ability to get in. And so um, we were, talking about the two different formats, about what works for your, your process, a normal angel conference that's separate from the accelerator or one that's integrated in the accelerator. Um, specifically, um, uh, the separate one might be focused at graduates of your accelerator from past rounds rather than current ones that are in it. And then, um, yeah, that's what, and, and that fixes the problem of having them know how to pick and all that because you probably already have graduates and that gives you time for them to to uh, help all your graduates instead of just the most recent ones. And then what does an LLC look like in your country? You know, how do you form a, a group of people investing? Um, and then back to this uh, funnel size, you know, if Looney's getting 450 applicants into his accelerator and then he's only taking in seven. And then part of that question is how does the relationship with the incoming company work? Are you investing and taking a uh, part of the company or are you donating or granting? What's the accelerator to company relationship? And then what's that initial investment look like? And then the trying to figure out what the size of the fund should be 
and we were taking a look at the question of how the uh, revenue-based process that Mooney was doing works. And so one of the things that makes it possible for um, companies to uh, be invested in when they're not really growth companies is to use the NDVC terms or some set of terms that do revenue redemption. And so that becomes an, a question then as well. Of, of what's and, the and that, I think that works up online already. That's the one I did in Singapore. Um, and NDVC is a new thing that's similar to that, that, uh, that we've talked about here in the States or here in Seattle. Yeah. Um, uh, we're, we'll form that into a formal Google form and send it to everyone who's on the invite for this, for this yeah. um, call. Did it seem like there were any questions that were missing or were there mess questions that didn't need to be there? Or, you know, if we're trying to figure out what the format of an angel training process would look like that involves the act of doing an investment rather than the read a book and talk about it version, um, what does that, what's the constraints in your context that would make that possible? Probably best in terms of process to post that up either as a Google Doc or Google Doc and a form on the uh, Slack channel so people have a chance to chat about it with their teams. Might be helpful. We won't, like, yeah, I, chances yeah. are people might need to talk to someone else in their team about it as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, make, that makes sense. Um, Is there a way that I can get access to the Slack channel? Can we add John to the Slack channel, please? Easy. Yeah. Shoot through your email address, John, and I'll add you. My, my last name at gmail.com. And in the last minute, there was one question on the chat window. Uh, Min asked, uh, what's my definition of startup? Uh, I just answered this on Quora the other day. Um, I do not abide by the um, elitists in Silicon Valley that says a startup has to be venture scale. Uh, I believe that any new company is a startup, no matter what they're doing. And corner stores is a startup if they're new. Um, you know, they may not be big enough to, in to, to invite into Fledge, but they're still a startup. Yeah, and I, I divide it slightly differently. I think that a startup is a company or an entity that's trying to form a business model. And once they've figured out the business model, they're a small business. And whether that's a growth business or a small business is a question about how they've structured their business. But the startup act is the discovery of that business model. And without that discovery, thing of discovering what the product is and discovering what the people are, you can just follow somebody else's recipe. And if yeah. I'm going to do a corner store and I know how to run a corner store, that's not really a startup. So I think the best benefit of this particular track is that we're not going to agree on, on, um, on a lot of stuff. Uh, and with that, unless there's some other questions, we're going to give you two minutes of your life back. Uh, and we'll see you on the next webinar. The next webinar, we're going to cover, uh, uh, two topics, angel investing 101, that you can uh, A, learn more about that and see what that content will be that we'll share with your, uh, your potential angels. Uh, and two, uh, fund management 101. Uh, so John's going to do angel investing 101. I'll do fund management, which, which is how do you do more than one investment at a time? How do you deal with uh, portfolios? How do, you pick, how do you pick when you get to pick more than one at a time? Um, and so we'll do that. I think it's a week. I think it might be a week or two away. It's on the calendar. All right. If not, uh, I'll say goodnight because it's late here. All right. Thanks very much, John. Thanks, Andy. Yep. Bye-bye.